Brad Lancaster is the author of the award-winning, best-selling book series, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. Now, it's actually been turned into an HBO miniseries that's overtaken Game of Thrones as the most watched HBO <laughs> series by students at uh, Cornell and UC Davis. So uh, he's going to be talking about water harvesting principles and the story of an African rain farmer. Brad, take it away. All right, so thanks so much for the opportunity to speak with you all and uh, uh, later share many ideas. Um, so uh, I want to talk to you about uh, water harvesting and why, why I talk about that, because water is life. And everywhere I go, the more water I find, the more life I find. And I find this both in the dry land environment where I'm from. I'm from an area only receiving 11 inches of rain a year on an average year, to uh, much wetter climates. And uh, I want to cover both conceptual principles or design guidelines for the harvest of water and strategies. And uh, I want to do so through the telling of the story of one of my primary teachers, Mr. Zephaniah Piri Maseko. Um, I learned from him in the driest region of Zimbabwe. And uh, the great thing about Mr. Piri is uh, he taught himself how to harvest the rain. And uh, one of the things I find very inspirational about his story is we have everything we need all around us. We just need to learn to see it and interact and partner with it. So um, very briefly, the introduction to his story is uh, he was, uh, in the 1960s, fired from his job working for the railroad uh, in what was at that time Rhodesia because he was very politically active, striving for democratic reform in the country. So he was fired and blacklisted and told he'd never work again in any profession, in any job. So out of desperation, he was looking for how could he support his family of eight with no job. And he turned to the only two things he felt he had to get him out of the situation. One was the very uh, eroded um, piece of land that he had. Um, and the second thing was the Bible. And he kind of used the Bible as a, uh, uh, a gardening manual of sorts. Because there in the story of Genesis, he said, wow, you know, this, this Garden of Eden, I like that idea. Uh, I need to create such a garden. Um, and, uh, but he thought about it a little bit more, and he realized that was not going to happen if he didn't get a good water system. So uh, he looked, um, he thought, well, how am I going to figure out that water piece? How am I going to get the, the creeks and the rivers to sustain this Garden of Eden? And... Uh, so that leads to the first of eight water harvesting principles that I'll give to you and that were cre um, co-created with Mr. Peary. Um, so the first one is long and thoughtful observation. So um, he just had a, um, a sixth grade education. He stuck here on the land with no support mechanism. So he started using what he had, his just observation. Every time it rained, he'd get out there and he'd run with the rain. And he would wanted to see where did the water flow? Where did it do too quickly run off and cause erosion and problems? Didn't want to mimic that. Or where did it instead slow down, linger, start to infiltrate and generate life? Now that's working. That's what he did want to mimic. So um, he noticed he had this bare, um, for the most part, bare rock uh, hill slope above his farm. Uh, this is a shot of that in the dry season. And uh, he noticed that uh, every time there'd be a good rain, he would lose chickens and other small livestock to the runoff flows coming off the hill. So that was not working. And he was losing more and more soil all the time. That was not working. But he noticed in a few areas, um, such as here, where there are rocks or other things perpendicular to the downslope flow, um, things would drop out of the flow when it, of water when it got slowed down, such as the, uh, the soil and whatnot here. Moisture would linger longer. Seeds could then germinate, and you could start to create, create a sponge growing on what was previously a drain. So he wanted to mimic that. So then in the wet season, you can see what that structure looked like. Um, he decided to mimic that, and he did um, hundreds of structures 
all with the intent of slowing down, spreading, and infiltrating more of the water. Um, and uh, what you can see here is there's a number of just one rock high structures um, which uh, slowed down the flow enough that m a lot of soil is accumulated here, a lot of vegetation has started to grow. And I don't know if you can pick up on it, but you can actually see these are seep springs have now formed. So moisture is wicking out both there and there. So I think it's amazing on what was previously just a barren rock slope, uh, he now literally has helped create seep springs. Um, by starting to um, reestablish the sponge on what was once an eroding drain. Okay, now the key thing here with this principal approach I'm trying to present here is uh, I find when I do this work, um, a lot of people get really interested in specific techniques, and I'm guilty of that too, okay? And they miss the big picture. So um, I will be giving you techniques, just gave you one with those little rock structures, <laughs> But I want you to think of more the big picture, the concept. What are you going for? Because all too often we get locked on one specific strategy and then we don't consider others. Or we don't consider how that could be improved or um, how it could better suit its unique context. So the main thing that's driven Mr. Peary's learning and evolution is this long and thoughtful observation. Okay, Seeing what works, build on that, see what doesn't work, change that. And, um, you can use multiple principle sets. I'm mainly going to give you these eight, eight water harvesting principles, but I do use a principle set from permaculture. You can use them from others. The light blue text is those permaculture principles. But um, the other thing I want you guys to consider is if you find a principle set that works, use it. If it doesn't work, change it. So one of the risks of my giving this talk is sometimes people will get locked onto some of these principles, like that's the way to go. These are not laws, okay? These are just things I have found helpful, that Mr. Peary has found helpful. I'm sharing them. If they work for you, use them. If they don't work for you, evolve them, okay? All right, that's setting the tone. <laughs> let's go to the next principle. So let's start at the top of the watershed and work down. Um, so Mr. Peary did that by starting at the very top of his hill slope and working down. Um, but we can do that in the home setting. So let's work with the free power of gravity. So let's start capturing that water on the roof. And instead of just directing it to a tank or rain gardens or earthworks at the low part of the property, if we send it all to the low part, now how are we going to get it to the high part? So I like to use the free power of elevation and gravity, and let's direct that water to the higher part of the land, from which we can then dole out the water from a tank, if we have a tank, to all points downstream. Or if we send it into basin-like shapes, we can send the overflow to all points downstream. This way, you're more efficiently able to hydrate more of the land, and you can more easily work with gravity to distribute it to all points below. Um, and what I find all too often is we collect the water in the low spot because that's where we see so much water, okay? And then we have a hard time of trying to get it back up. So I like to have many different strategies starting at the very top and stepping down to the bottom, all infiltrating the water. So it's more easily dealt with in the low points. Okay. Um, and so here is a little diagram of Mr. Peary's farm. And uh, you see the hill above and some of the rock structures, rock walls he put across the slope. We'll soon see some infiltration um, reservoirs. And then we'll go into the family compound and we'll move down until we end up at the wetlands and the banana plantation at the very bottom. Okay. So uh, this is looking at the hilltop. And uh, you can see some of the rock uh, structures he's put across the slope. Uh, this was taken in the dry season. And this is now looking from the hill down uh, below. Um, you can see in the foreground, we've got uh, one of those rock structures and then more below. Um, and you can see the soil starting to accumulate and some of the vegetation dormant in the, uh, in the uh, winter months there. Um, so, uh, and then this is in the wet season, same shot. You can see uh, more of the green vegetation um, and that sponge starting to form. So uh, 
the, when doing this work, um, I find a lot of times people get a little intimidated and they think, oh, I've got to start at the top. And they might go to the very highest point. But that's not their land. That's not where they can work. So just think, well, what's the highest point of my, uh, of, um, my watershed of access? And so look here, we might have a lo very large watershed, but this is, this is the only land that we're really managing. Well, that's fine. Start there. Um, so try and find your acupuncture points, the easier points to begin, um, and uh, all, all will be good. So, uh, and when we are starting with the, uh, the water harvesting and whatnot, uh, very often I find, especially in the rural setting, dirt roads tend to be one of the highest points of liability, the greatest cost to people, and uh, the points of uh, some of the most serious erosion. Now, uh, these photos were taken in Arizona, where I'm from, um, but it could be a dirt road anywhere. Because typically the way they're built and maintained is we turn them into the lowest point in the landscape. So um, if you can see here that the landscape drops and then goes back up. So once water enters that road, there's no way out. And sometimes we'll create drains, as is the case here, but all too often the water continues down the, the road. Why is that? Because water's lazy. It takes the path of least resistance. So in just that little rut, wheel rut, water will continue down that and bypass the drain. So um, a key strat um, one of many techniques one could do is a rolling dip diversion. So what is that? Well, it's like a typical drain on the side, but it also, you're taking the dirt you dug out of the drain to create a raised berm, or we call it the rollout, okay? And that's it at a diagonal um, across the road. So um, the wheel ruts are no longer the low point. Now water has no option but to go off and down the drain. Um, and the key thing, too, when doing this work, if, if you have a bulldozer, um, you use the tracks of the bulldozer to create imprints or micro basins to capture seed and water. And what we have here, this guy, his hand is showing the height of native grass growing over here. The water um, that was directed off the road in a very dry setting in southwestern Arizona is now growing waist-high native grasses. Now, in Florida, you're probably like, yeah, whatever. But in Arizona, that's amazing, okay? That's incredible. Um, so, uh, but the key thing here is that that road and its runoff is used as a water source to grow um, more of that grass. So when we do these rolling dip structures and others, there's another principle set we use. You want to get the water off the road your first chance, the first opportunity. Basically, that means start at the top. You don't want it to start running down the road too long and erode too much of the road before you divert it off. Secondly, divert the water off at your best chance. So you want to use this as a resource. So don't just direct it anywhere to a steep slope. Try and find a more gradual slope so your drain will not become an erosion point, but it can become a point that spreads water out, okay? And where do you want to grow more vegetation? That's a great best point, okay? And then do your last chance, your last opportunity before you maybe get a very channelized road and there's no opportunity to get it out, okay? So those are the three. So do your first chance, your best chance, and your last chance because you want to avoid that no chance. <laughs> OK, so here's, um, here's some examples of how this was done in northern New Mexico. So there used to be a dirt road. Well, it's still a dirt road running through here. Water would run down the, the wheel tracks, causing a lot of erosion. So these simple um, rolling dip structures were diverting the, the water off. And you can see that the drain was made long enough to go past this second uh, wheel rut road, 
so it could be distributed into the much more gradually sloping area here to then grow more grass. Um, you don't see the after effects because this is a photo right after construction before the rains hit. Um, oh, did I? I didn't even change the slide. Sorry, I was showing myself on the previous slide you can see. So, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so here is the uh, structure um, uh, bypassing the second road and kicking the water off into the much more gradually sloping area. So a great example of your best chance. Okay. So um, an, the next uh, principle is we want to start with small and simple strategies. So why small and simple? Well, so we, so we actually start, <laughs> okay? So we'll actually do this. Um, if we start with things that are too big and complex, we get intimidated and never get going. So that could be planting vegetation within or beside a simple basin that holds the water. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll go into what vegetation is best within these structures in just a moment. So uh, if you've got existing vegetation, uh, you don't want to dig these basins under the drip edge of the plants. You're going to um, disturb too many roots. So in this instance, we've gone beyond the drip edge of the plants and made the basins. Um, and then when it rains, it captures the water, and then the, the trees can access that water. You might think, well, how? It's too far. No, it's not too far. So we need to think like the plants. So with our perennials, um, such as our trees and shrubs, their root network um, typically extends to three times the diameter of the drip edge of the plant. So this arc is trying to represent where the bulk of the water is uptaken by the plant's roots. And notice that two-thirds of that is beyond the drip edge of the plant here, okay? So we want to work with these uh, natural systems and understanding. And Okay, so um, we can apply these basins uh, where we live, work, and play, and I like to focus a lot of the work where um, we have a hardscape surface, be it a road, maybe it's an earthen, uh, earthen road, could be paved road where it's a roof, um, because we're going to have more runoff from that surface. So here, in this blue circle, I call this the oasis zone. It's within 30 feet or nine meters of the hardscape surface. So we can get double, triple, quadruple the normal rainfall in this zone, because you've got the rain falling from the sky uh, onto these tree basins, but you've also got the rain falling on the roof and being directed to those areas, at least doubling or more the available rainfall. So I like to start in those areas. Those are my wetter areas. And a uh, principle a friend uses is, let's make our wet spots wetter, okay? So we've already got the moisture, we've already got the potential for life, let's enhance that. So this is an example of that. So um, here we've uh, planted all the trees within water harvesting basins, and we can direct the rainfall, the runoff, and gray water to those. So in times of no rain, we can direct gray water, the wa once used water from our sinks or, or whatnot, um, in this case with a dotted line representing a pipe. Um, and then we get this resulting true oasis living around the structure. And uh, in tomorrow's workshop, I'll cover this more, but we can set up the, our trees in such a way that we can harvest the winter sun and deflect, deflect the summer sun. So um, this band of trees here, in the if we're in the northern hemisphere, we leave the equator-facing side of the home open to the winter sun, which is always going to be low in the sky. And then we plant the trees on the east-west, and if you're in the northern hemisphere, the north side of the house, to shade you from the rising and setting sun, which will rise in the northeast and set in the northwest. We'll cover more of that tomorrow. Okay. So some uh, ways of starting small and simple, some other ways. Um, so here in Zimbabwe, a great example of in the wash station, um, they're directing all the wash water to uh, mulberry tree and other plantings. Um, super basic, super common sense, but I see that everywhere in the US, Africa, elsewhere, um, that opportunity missed, where 
that's water is not reused. Here outside the um, the latrines is um, uh, a newly planted tree protected by from the goats with the uh, the fence. But we have a tippy tap. So um, when you wash. Uh, Maybe you all are familiar with that, but when you wash your hands, you got the little foot lever that tips the jug of water so you don't touch the jug and so, okay. So just direct that to the plant, super simple. Um, another means is uh, Mr. Peary, what he would do is at the base of his hill where the slope was steeper, where it became more gradual and soil started to accumulate rather than be eroded away, he dug what he calls an immigration center. Okay, this, this reservoir. So he dug it right down to the bedrock. Um, and uh, here, uh, he welcomes the rain. And uh, I didn't, I couldn't understand this idea of an immigration center when he first mentioned it. And I said, why? You know, you're, you're, you're teaching me about water. Why are you talking about immigration all of a sudden? He said, no, you don't, you don't understand. When it rains, I stand here not in the bottom of the reservoir, but the top. And I shout out to the rain, welcome to my country. Now I will tell you where you will live. In the soil. And, okay. and uh, I talked to his neighbors, and they confirm this. He, he does this. <clears throat> um, so he's really big on this in that he wants, uh, he wants the water in the soil, not on top of it, because there he loses far less of it to evaporation, and it's not as erosive. It's not running over the surface very quickly. It's more moving very slowly um, beneath the surface. Um, and this is also his water gauge, because he knows if he fills this two times in a year, he has enough water to last him through a two-year drought. Okay. Now, it's not because of this one reservoir structure. It's because of hundreds of different strategies throughout his farm, all slowing down, spreading out, and infiltrating, and banking more of that rain into his soils. Um, okay. And this is what the reservoir looked like um, a number of years later, 20 years later, um, and that's his son and his grandson. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Peary passed away uh, last year, um, but they are carrying on his work. Um, so uh, the next principle is we want to slow spread uh, and infiltrate the flow of water. I've, I've been saying this previously, but slow spread and sink it. So we don't want this straight shot of the water from its runoff source uh, to its drain point. Instead, we want to zigzag it as much as possible to uh, increase the soil water content, uh, soil, soil water content and the amount of time um, the, uh, the water has a chance to infiltrate. So an example of that here is right at the homestead house. Water comes off the roof. It's then directed into this uh, cistern. The overflow from that is directed to a basin to then grow the granadilla vine that shades and cools the water in the tank. Um, and then run off overflow from this basin goes to another and another and another. So it's this whole stepped system. Um, of maximizing that zigzag flow. Uh, another means of slowing, spreading, and infiltrating the flow of water is with contour um, swales or check dams or berms. Um, so the flow is this way. The structure is put across the flow. So when it rains, this whole area, uh, the water backs up and um, then can start to infiltrate. You can do that with soil, with rock, or with living vegetation, um, whatever makes the most sense in your context. Huh. You know, if I start talking and it sounds like uh, I have changed the slide, but you don't see a change in slide, <laughs> um, yell at me. Because as I look at this, um, sometimes it doesn't register there, so I have to double check. Okay. So um, another means of slowing, spreading, and infiltrating the flow of water is with peary pits or fruition pits. So um, in the 1960s in Mr. Peary's area, the government put in um, drainage swales. So they are very gradually sloping drains that would go across the slope, and, uh, they did, and then they would direct the water to centralized drains. They did this to reduce flooding in downstream areas, and it 
it worked in reducing flooding, but unfortunately it also dehydrated the land of its sole source of water. Um, so people could no longer grow the crops they once had because the water had been drained away. So um, the way they were built is they dug out uh, a basin, put the dirt on the downslope side to make a berm, and this was a continuous gradual slope. So what Mr. Peary did is he went in after they did that work and he dug out these pits. They tend to be um, about three meters long, a meter deep, and uh, two meters wide. And then uh, when one fills up, it will overflow over um, the high point into the next one. So after the rains have stopped, he, unlike his neighbors whose drains are dry, his all have these pits filled with water, perking that water into the soil. And it's still helping reduce flooding because if there's too much water for um, all his pits, the surplus can still flow out of the system. But the key thing is he's no longer draining all the water out of the system. He's only draining the surplus. Okay, another means we can slow spread and infiltrate the water is with a sheet flow spreader. Okay, which is a rock structure. And um, the way this works is you basically lay the rock one rock high, dead level, okay? So this drawing, this line is meant to show a contour line, a dead level line. So you lay the rocks right out on, on the contour line and then the very end points you bring them up slope. And the point is you want water to flow through and over the structure but not cut around it. The context here is we've got all this sheet flow water coming off a slope into a drainage ditch along a road which is then channelized in this culvert. So usually at the, down, at, at the end of a culvert, you have a lot of erosion because you've had this huge concentration of that water, okay? So here we want to mellow that flow. We want to spread it out again. And so that's what this structure was used for. And this is a photo of it. So here's the channelized flow hitting the structure right after it was built and Along with it just being one rock high, you put native seed, like native grass seed, under the rock before you lay the rock. Why? Because you want to generate a living system that will take over. Okay? So here is the structure after the rains. You can see all the grass growing through it. And then at the end of the growing season, you can't even see the structure anymore. But you notice the bulk of the growth is on the structure. Okay, now this structure is really effective in high sediment areas. So the previous talk about Haiti, so this would be a great structure in Haiti because it's a very sediment uh, heavy area, okay? Whereas the um, diversion swale I showed you before and the pits, probably not a good strategy in many parts of Haiti because it's just gonna fill up with sediment, okay? But this particular structure, it's meant to catch sediment, okay? Um, and you only do it one rock high. Some people get excited and they want to do many rocks high. Don't do that. It's only one rock high because you want vegetation to grow through it so that the vegetation becomes the living component. Um, and as more sediment gathers, the vegetation continues to grow through the structure. Okay? Um, another Example of this in a different context is a one rock high check dam, which Mr. Peary did. So it's only one rock high, but many rocks wide, okay? And um, uh, again, planted with, with seed. Um, this is put within uh, a channel, within a waterway. Um, here's an example of that done by uh, another friend and colleague. So this is in northern New Mexico. He's standing on the one rock structure and he has helped bring back this wetland of these uh, native wetland grasses. Um, before it was just bare bedrock. Um, now here's a key way of creating this structure. The bottom slope, uh, the most downslope row of rocks, you anchor that, you dig that down into the ground. So the top of the rock is basically level with the bottom of the channel. Now why do you do that? Because you don't want to create 
a waterfall effect. If you had a tall rock and the water just dropped off, it would speed up the water flow and it would become more erosive. You don't want to do that. So we want a nice gradual speed hump shape, okay? And again, we put the seed under the rock before we put the rock down. Once it fills up with sediment and vegetation starts to grow through the rock, you can build it up another level, okay? And again, just one rock high structure, never more than one rock high, okay? And the bottom half of the previous structure becomes your stabilized spillway, okay? Now, uh, part of the reason I like promoting this is um, I come from a world, the permaculture world, where they're big into gabions, these big check dams. Um, and uh, they tend to fail um, quite regularly. And, uh, but it's like this heroic approach. You put in this big structure, you feel like you did a great job, and it uh, gathers a lot of sediment. It seems like it did great, but then it eventually um, breaks loose and you lose it all. Um, so when I first was exposed to this strategy, I thought, that's too small. That can't be anything significant. But a colleague of mine, he's taken 30-foot deep gullies and in 10 years, he's risen the bed level in these gullies 10 feet with these simple structures. And the water does the bulk of the work. Again, just one rock high, let it fill in with sediment, let the vegetation start to grow, and then you can build it again. And so it's slow work, but now it doesn't blow out. You don't lose everything in a big storm. You might lose your one check dam that hasn't yet filled in with sediment, but you're not going to lose that which has filled in with sediment, okay? All right, I maybe spent too much time on that. Uh, yeah, don't have time. Okay, one other little quick thing. This sheet flow spreader, this, this one rock check dam, it is a sediment trap. That's what it is. So you want to put it where sediment naturally is trapped. So if we're going to put it in a waterway, a meandering waterway, never put it on the bend of a waterway. Because on the outer part of the bend, it's always cutting and creating pools. So it's going to destroy your structure there. Whereas on the inside of the bend, you have sediment accumulating. Okay, It would stick around there, but you'd lose it here. So you want to put it in what's called the crossover riffle. So where the water naturally meanders from one side to the next, in that point, where the water crosses from one side to the other is called the crossover riffle. That is where sediment naturally accumulates without the cutting. So that's where these structures go. And if you're going to put in a road crossing, that's where it goes. Okay? Don't have time to cover that more. Um, another slow spread and sink strategy is planting on contour. Um, you can do terracing. Okay, and, uh, and now let's get to the next principle. You always want to have an overflow and use it as a resource. Okay, that, that might seem super simple and obvious, but uh, all the time I find people don't pay attention to that. Okay, and now this gets to why do these principles exist? These principles exist because of Mr. Peary and others working for decades doing this work, and they found Sometimes things worked really well, and sometimes things didn't work at all. This principle comes from the lessons learned when things didn't work. <laughs> okay, when there's not a planned overflow, there will be failure. So these principles are meant as reminders. Oh, did I remember to do the overflow and use it as a resource? Yes, okay, good. Or if not, okay, I got to get back and do that. So if we have a tank, oftentimes I have people put in tank systems where they have the inflow but no planned overflow. So water backs up against the corner of the house and erodes the house. So you want to have an overflow pipe the same diameter as the inflow, not smaller. Okay? Then direct that to where it can be a resource, perhaps a rain garden basin um, that can grow a tree to shade and cool the water in the tank. And then overflow that from one basin to another through uh, maybe a contour swale and overflow to a rain garden. S you're s slowing, spreading, sinking, zigzagging that flow. So Mr. Peary did that, as I mentioned before, with his fruition pits. This is uh, one of his pits beside the road. 
um, the fruition pit made in the diversion swale, the drainage swale the government had put in. You come back in the wet season, a um, number of years later, and this is what that looks like. So um, planted with many multi-use uh, plants. Um, and I want to emphasize too, Mr. Peary is planting a huge diversity of plantings, primarily perennials, because they're there year after year. And while he is bringing in some exotic um, food-bearing plants and whatnot, he's really got a very strong emphasis on the native plants of his area. So what has been used traditionally in the ethnobotanical record um, and what's uh, been forgotten, he's trying to bring those uh, plants back because they're the best adapted to his local climate, soils, and wildlife. Um, okay. Uh, I come from the permaculture world where people love swales, contour swales, um, and they can work real well, but they can also be problematic. And they tend to have their weakest point at the overflow because you've got all this water has come off the slope, been concentrated behind the structure, and then you have a pinch point overflow. So you've dramatically increased the volume of the water, and potentially the depth, and the slope right here where the water spills over. So these tend to become the most erosive points which can blow out the whole structure. Which gets to a concept I want to bring to you all, which is the erosion triangle. So here's the triangle. And we have speed, depth, and volume at each point. So the chance of erosion or the, the, the potential force of erosion is increased any time you increase the speed, the depth, and or the volume. And maybe a better way of saying this is this triangle helps relate water's ability to carry things, be it sediment or other things. So the more speed, depth, or volume the flowing water has, the more it can carry, the more energy it has to carry things. But if you decrease the speed, the depth, or the volume, you decrease flowing water's ability to carry things. Okay? So um, going back to this, so these, these overflows kind of suck, all right? <laughs> because we're concentrating a huge amount of water, so increasing the volume, okay? And then at the overflow point, because we now have this artificial hump and the water has to flow down it, it's now flowing over a steeper slope than it would naturally. So we've increased the speed. We've increased two points of the erosion triangle. Okay, now why am I bringing this up? <laughs> I could just say do an overflow a different way. Because I find when I work with folks, if you don't understand the thinking behind the strategy, it's going to fail at some point. It's much more important we understand the process. Okay, so um, this is a much better overflow point for a swale. So here, there is no berm at the overflow point. There's the contour basin made, but there's been no berm made on the downslope side. So if the basin fills with water, the overflow, it just sheets in a very wide, spread out manner over the same steepness of slope that the water came from, okay? So we're not increasing the speed, we're not increasing um, the volume, okay? We're not increasing depth either. Okay, hope that makes sense. <laughs> uh, and here's, um, uh, this gentleman, Handsome, uh, in um, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, he did that here. So he's got a lot of water pooled in this, uh, the basin of this swale, and then he's got a very, it doesn't show up that well in the photo, but there's no berm on the downslope side. So water just evenly spreads out across all his field here, and then his, the overflow is caught by another water harvesting structure below. This guy, he is, well, just an incredible master. I've never seen anyone more adept at slowing, spreading, and sinking water than him. Okay, here's another way we can use water, um, have an overflow and use it as a resource. So I like these structures better. Um, this simple berm is used to concentrate water for a planting, like a tree here. 
But its overflow is at the end of the structure, not over the structure. So we don't increase the slope and thus the speed of the water. It's much more stable, okay? And we are not concentrating a huge amount of water that then overflows at one point. So we're not increasing the volume. So it's a much more stable overflow. I'm just trying to give you guys these examples to maybe see through how the erosion triangle is applied and choosing what might be a better overflow strategy. Okay, um, and uh, let's see, don't have time for that one, so let me skip on. Um, so another key concept when managing water is this idea of key elevation relationships. So um, first off, if you're wanting to harvest water, you need to make sure that whatever structure you're using, the bottom point of that structure is lower than the overflow point. Now hopefully you guys are going, well, yeah, of course, but all the time I find people miss this. So they tend to have their overflow point at the same elevation as the bottom of their structure, so it, it holds no water, okay? The next key point is you want to make sure the top of the overflow spillway is lower than the edge of your structure um, so that the overflow point is where you want it. Okay, you're not letting the, the, the water determine its overflow point. And finally, that also taps on the last is that's partly if this overflow point gets clogged you don't want water backing up and hitting it and flooding anything you don't want flooded, okay? So I'm always watching those three key elevation points. Um, all right, so back um, to, whoops, Mr. Peary's farm. So we were just along the road here where he had his fruition pits. We'll now move down, uh, down here to his hand dug wells and uh, his reservoirs. Um, so the next principle of uh, water harvesting is, of the eight that I'm presenting is you want to maximize your living and organic ground cover. So uh, sometimes I find people get excited about the idea of planting the rain in these, these earthworks. Um, they like, like the ponds and the dams. But uh, the key to really m reach the, the true effectiveness of these systems is we need to maximize the life in the system. And so, if we're gonna get all this water into the soil, how are you gonna get it back out? Okay, well you can dig a well, you can access it through the well, um, you can perhaps access it through recharged springs or creeks, but we can also access that water in the form of plants. So they are living pumps. So we can access the water in the form of the fruit, the shelter, um, the building materials and whatnot that the plant provides. And below the plant, uh, I like to maximize the amount of organic matter. I'm, I'm not a, into um, the, the raking up and the burning or the disposal of the organic matter. I want to keep it around. So um, the, I think leaves are called leaves because we're supposed to leave them, okay? Um, so that they can decompose and the nutrients can go back into the system. And uh, Mr. Peary, he grows out, or he grew out um, hundreds of trees and shrubs, which he would give away for free to everyone in his community, in the hope that they would re help reforest and re-sponge their part of the watershed. Um, and I thought that was fantastic that he he was doing that um, until I learned that most of the trees he gave away died. And so when I learned that, I asked him, well, why, why is that the case? And he said, oh, it's, it's simple. He said, people love to plant trees, but almost nobody plants the water. And that, wa that tree will not live without the water. So he always plants the rain before he plants any plant. Okay, And I've been trying to show you many different means by which you can plant that rain. Um, and... Uh, um, other ways of uh, maximizing the living organic ground cover is you can, you can plant the mulch, you can, uh, and then down here, you can ha bring in mulch. Um, 
And we can take areas like maybe you've got a, um, a compound uh, that's kept um, swept up and whatnot. That can be our source of organic matter for the areas where um, it is OK um, to have the organic matter. Uh, we can have contour plantings. And thanks. <laughs> OK. okay. Uh, and let's make sure our structures are living. So very often I see people put in contour berms and whatnot, but uh, it's just bare earth. Let's Let's make sure they're alive. So they're not just eroding with time, but they're actually building with time. OK, so let's speed up here. All right, another concept is when we are planting the water, we need to figure out well, what plants best in these structures. So if you've got a basin such as here, I break up my rain gardens uh, into three zones, the bottom, the terrace, and the top. And to figure out what plant goes where, I go take a hike. I go into the intact parts of my local ecosystem, wherever I am, and I see what grows in the low spots periodically inundated with water and sediment. That's the stuff that's going to do well in the, the built low spots. What needs a little better drainage? Here. What is the least water tolerant? That goes up here. Okay, And then once it fills with water, you can see the difference between the zones here. Okay, And then once that water infiltrates, the key is, again, with the most of what I'm promoting here, it's about getting the water into the soil, not storing it on top of the soil. So then the soil becomes our tank. And then the vegetation becomes our living pump uh, and an extension, a living extension of the tank as well. The seventh principle, we always want to make sure our water harvesting does more than harvest water. So we can have a tank overflowing to a tree within a basin those can be placed on the east or west side of the house to shade and cool the house from the morning and afternoon sun and summer. We can select vegetation for food, wildlife habitat, um, and the overall system can double as flood control. The, the key is you know, make sure your thinking is beyond just the harvest and capture of the water. What else can it do? So here Mr. Peary is by one of his hand dug wells. Um, and then the same well I visited um, for, uh, 20 some years ago, uh, 20 years later. So uh, his family is known as the family of water because, as he jokes, he always has enough water into which he can dip his hand and drink from his hand. So um, for over 30 years, he invested his time and energy into strategies that put more water into the soil than he took out. So he takes the water out in the form of his plants and with his hand dug wells. But since he's putting so much more in, his well levels have gone up over the years, okay? as have his neighbors on either side and downstream of him. Um, and yet, people more distant from him in the community, uh, their wells keep going dry. And they keep digging them deeper, and then they go dry again. Why? Because they're just extracting without giving back. Um, okay, I'm going to bypass that. So uh, it used to be that um, when I visited Mr. Peary in 1995, he used this donkey pump to pump water from his hand-dug well to irrigate his fields. When I went back in 2014, he abandoned the donkey pump. He's now brought the water level up to the roots of his crops. Okay, um, He brought the water to the plants. Okay, And here at the bottom of his site, he's got uh, wetlands. Um, he's got reservoirs where he raises fish. Uh, and um, these ponds will go dry in the dry season. And when that happens, he throws a big community fish fry for everyone in the, uh, in the community. Um, but the key thing here is I mentioned at the beginning how he wanted to create the Garden of Eden. And he realized he needed the water source to grow that garden. Well, the water source was the rain. And he planted that rain rather than draining that rain. Okay? And by doing so, he has created subsurface rivers or creeks on his land. So uh, he accesses that creek. I mean, this is it. The water in his, in his hand dug wells and here in this reservoir, that is the groundwater table level in his land. Okay? Um, and here is son and grandson in 2016 and the abundance of what that is producing. And uh, so 
to wrap it up here, um, here we're at the bottom of his site, below the reservoir, and uh, in his banana plantation. And I was amazed when I saw this, because it's all dry farmed, okay? And uh, meaning it's just, it's just from the rainfall. And uh, I asked him how long it took him to do all this, and he said 30 years. Okay, and that was 20 years ago when I asked him that. And uh, it shocked me, cause, and it depressed me, and I said, 30 years, that's such a long time. And uh, then he slapped me on the shoulder, and he said, Brad, that's life. Life's a slow process. You just need to start, okay? And he reminded me again, it's best to start with long and thoughtful observation. Learn from what the land can tell you. Uh, start at the top of your watershed and work down, where it's easiest to begin. Your, your strategies are less likely to blow out. Start by slowing, spreading, and sinking the flow of water. Start by always having an overflow and using it as a resource. Um, start by making sure your water harvesting strategies do more than harvest water. Start by ensuring there's more life by maximizing the organic ground cover and life within. And then you come back to the beginning. The last principle is the same as the first, long and thoughtful observation, okay? Or said a different way, the feedback loop. So this is not meant to be a do it and leave it. This is, this is a constant cycle and recheck. So as you're doing this work and you're experimenting, if something works, try and figure out why is it working and then do more of it. If it's not working, change it, okay? Evolve, okay, that's the key. We gotta evolve. Um, and uh, um, last piece on Mr. Peary is uh, for whatever reason after spending my first time with him, I started to vent about how bad the situation was in my community with water, and I told him I wanted to leave. I wanted to run from that. And that, that's when he slapped me again on the shoulder. And he said, you can't leave. He said, you have to go back, and you have to set your roots deeper than you ever thought possible. And you have to try and figure out solutions. Because if you just run from your problems, you're gonna plant those problems everywhere you grow you go, and you're going to grow more problems. But if you can instead try and figure out how to transform those problems into solutions, well then, you have the ability to do that wherever you go. Um, and thanks to Mr. Peary, that's become my line of work and my life. Um, and if you guys would like more info, um, I can't recommend these books enough. Um, <laughs> So they're available from the Echo Store. I've, I've also got some. Um, uh, and go to my website. Lots of free info and resources there. And uh, if you'd like more information on Mr. Peary beyond that, which I've um, written in my books, uh, check out moonday.org. Um, so they're the organization that is most continuing his legacy work. Um, and uh, uh, one of the other great things that they've done is they've got the annual Peary Award where they recognize local innovators like Mr. Peary in the, in the area for their innovations, their, their indigenous innovations that are now they're helping take out to more of the area um, and the world. Okay, thanks, thanks so much.